Hey folks, Matt Eaton here, Scholar Gladiatoria, and today we're going to talk a little bit about armour fitting and how it's fitted to the wearer and how important the fit really is. So in the medieval period, in the 14th and 15th centuries, plate armour was very prevalent. Of course, male armour didn't disappear. It was still worn underneath um, plate armour. And in, sometimes it was in fact worn as an independent uh, defence by itself. Uh, but the simple fact is that plate armour, because of its uh, shell-like structure, um, preferably has to be fitted to the wearer, although it wasn't always in reality. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go deeper into this video. We're also going to look at why it's very important that certain pieces of armour are made to work with other certain pieces of armour when they interact in particular ways. But before I go on, we're going to have a word from our sponsors who are Raid Shadow Legends, uh, my favourite mobile and PC um, turn-based fantasy combat game. Can you imagine fitting an amazing, truly AAA quality game right into your pocket? Something you can dive into and play anytime, wherever you are. Now you can with Raid Shadow Legends. There are 500 champions to collect, each with their own skill trees and millions of artefacts to find and equip. No two champions will ever be the same. That makes for literally trillions of ways to build your teams, crazy depth and endless strategies to figure out. So as you guys know, there's a bunch of things I like about this game. You've heard tons about it on my channel and probably other channels as well. Um, I most like uh, playing in uh, person versus person arena battles, but there are a bunch of other things in the game that I like as well. One of those things is summoning new champions. Now, a little top tip for you here. When you get at your summoning portal here, um, you get boosted summons if you wait for the right time. So if you save up your shards, um, which come in different levels, but if you save up your shards for this time, then when you uh, actually go to summon your new champions, during that time when you get boosted summons, you're more likely to get really good ones. I also enjoy training up champions in the sparring pit just here. What I probably enjoy most about Raid actually is customising my team and gradually advancing uh, their levels, their equipment, um, levelling up their equipment and making them tougher and basically winning. And remember when you're playing Raid, when you um, complete certain quests, so when you do something like fighting five arena battles a day, then you get rewards and you go down to the quests down here, you see what you've achieved and you claim your prize. So what's new in Raid? Well Raid just released the Artifact Forge where you can save time and craft artifacts directly as well as a whole new advanced quest system with amazing rewards. And that's not all. They also brought out some amazing new champions and they're developing the amazing looking Doom Tower as we speak which I'm super excited about. You can find me in the game under the name Captain Context of course and if you're quick enough you can join my clan. So what are you waiting for? Go to the video description below, click the links there and if you're a new player you will get 100,000 silver plus one free champion, the Acolyte. All this treasure will be waiting for you up here in the inbox which looks like a little treasure chest. These rewards are only available to new players and only for the next 30 days. So good luck and see you there. So thanks for staying with us and now back to armour. So the reason I'm holding these two particular pieces of armour up is for a very good reason. That's because the main point of this video is how certain pieces of armour that interact directly with each other and I'll, I'll get a little bit more in depth on, on that particular um, nugget of detail in a minute. Um, when they interact directly with each other it's very important that they are either made together, um, in other words they're kind of a set, they're a matching set, or they are, uh, one of them is made to go with the pre-existing piece. So say for example I'm a uh, man-at-arms or a billman or something in the 15th century, middle of the 15th century, and I own this salet, but I've decided that I really want to make sure that the lower part of my face is better protected and so I want to order a bever. Well it's not simply about the colour or style of them or anything like that, although that can also be an important factor if you want to look cool, um, but quite simply this bever needs to work with this helmet. When this visor is down, that bever has to sit inside of it. Now believe it or not, in my uh, earlier life I had a different helmet. Uh, when I dabbled in the world of Wars of the Roses reenactment 20 years ago, um, I had a um, salet 
And then I did, much like this imaginary man at arms in the 15th century, decide to get a bever to go with it. And I stupidly went and bought a bever at a uh, trading fair without having my sally with me. And lo and behold, the bever didn't fit into the sally. Now it's not just a question of size, it's also a question of shape. And if you look at the bottom of the uh, sally here, it has a certain outline that should be matched fairly closely by the line of the bever going into it. And if one curves, if one's a bit more pointy at the front than the other, or if one curves slightly differently around the side, it's a bit like a sword blade in a scabbard. You can't just assume that your sword blade is going to fit in a similar looking scabbard. It might not do. The curvature might be slightly different. The distal taper might be slightly different. And it's the same with a sale and a bever. So those two things have to go together. Now, as I said, that doesn't 100% mean that you have to buy them together, but you have to at least have one and check that the other matches. Now in reality, um, in the medieval period, not everyone could afford to have armour made bespoke for them. And this is something which I think that a lot of people on the internet are, are some, sometimes make misleading statements um, because they're trying to educate people who don't know much about the medieval period or don't know much about armour. They make this very strong hard point about how armour has to be made to you and has to be made to fit you. But if we delve deeper into the subject, if we start looking at the medieval records, at the texts that remain, we see that lots of armour was actually handed down in wills uh, and in inventories. So armour wasn't just made for an individual and then when they died it was scrapped. It was handed on and it was used by other people. Um, equally, sometimes armour was literally mass produced. So famously in Florence, uh, during the wars between the Italian city-states, um, Florence, Milan and other of the city-states, they uh, Pisa and so on and so forth, produced and kept armour in storage for when it was needed and then dished it out to the soldiers. So in some cases, you might be given a helmet or you might inherit a helmet that doesn't fit you fantastically, but you have to make do because that's that's what you've got. Um, and if you want to partner it up with a, uh, with a beva, well then your beva might also come out of store and they might not have been made together. So you might go through a few different bevas and find one that fits. Equally, if you were buying one in a shop, and again, if you're thinking about video games or role-playing games, this kind of thing, or even writing a novel, if a person is buying armour from a shop, they need to have the corresponding or the relative related pieces of armour so that they can check that the two things work together. Now I've used this example of the um, Sale and the Bever fitting together, okay, that they have to go together in order to function. What does that actually mean? Well, it doesn't literally only mean that, you know, for one to fit inside the other. They actually need to work together as well. And sometimes quite subtle differences or subtle conflicts between two pieces of armour can create a real pain in the butt when you actually start wearing the stuff and riding horses and trying to fight and doing all of the things that you need to do on a military campaign. So it's very important that those two pieces of armour don't only superficially fit together, but they actually work together as well. Now this is an issue when I see people uh, in the modern world accumulating armour piecemeal, piece by piece. Not to say that that's necessarily a bad thing, um, and you can definitely do it, and in fact with my next armour I'm intending to do that myself. But it's very important that where two pieces interact a lot, that you have the armourer who's providing the new piece um, a check that it will work with the old piece and if it doesn't then alterations need to be made maybe to the old piece maybe not to the new piece remember that old armor can be altered in some cases some armor can't be altered so easily so salets were in fact occasionally ordered um, and we do see salets you notice I'm saying salé and salet I'm trying to train myself to say salet rather than salé uh, but uh, old habits die hard certainly for me um, but salets um, were altered and in fact we do know thanks to Dr Tobias Capwell's um, research I'm aware of the fact that some salets were um, altered into later close helmets so sometimes you can see a 15th century salet hidden inside a beginning of the 16th century uh, close helmet so they just 
cut bits off and add bits on and use basically the helmet bowl um, for later helmets. In fact, we do even see medieval helmets turned into other objects, not even just other armour. We see, sometimes see them turned into pots, believe it or not. Uh, so some medieval helmets have survived archaeologically because they were used as pots and uh, buckets for wells and all sorts of stuff. So um, going back to the original point, it's very important that uh, armour that's being reused is check that it works with the corresponding new pieces or different pieces that you're having to put with it. Where, which particular parts of armour do you need to check that with? Well, I've already mentioned helmet and bever. So any, you know, this could also be true of maybe a wrapper or gorget that goes with an armet, for example, or a close helmet. Um, there are wrappers, in fact, worn even with great helms uh, back in the 14th century. So any, anything which goes on the throat needs to interact correctly with the helmet, obviously. But equally, anything that goes on the throat needs to interact with the breastplate correctly, especially if it needs to connect to it. And in some cases, certain types of uh, neck defence actually connect, certain types of um, bever, for example, actually connect either strap or in some case have a pin and a, um, a pin with a kind of bolt projection. They actually uh, connect to the breastplate. Um, so obviously any connecting points need to work. One that I think gets overlooked quite a lot is shoulder defences and the cuirass. Okay, so particularly with large pauldrons, large pauldrons overlap the breastplate and the backplate. So obviously they need to be deep enough to fit around the breast and backplate, the cuirass, and not interfere too much with the movement um, in either way. And equally, of course, we talk about fit of armour as well. So uh, a breastplate, say you have a cuirass um, that you have inherited, for example, from your dad, and your dad was just a little bit smaller than you. Uh, you don't get the breastplate stretcher, <laughs> but you do get an, an armourer potentially to alter the, um, the arm apertures on the, the breastplate such that you still have full mobility of movement and things like this. You might even need the way that the breastplate and the backplate go together, you might need to have that expanded slightly or the angles altered slightly so uh, that you've got the full movement ability for your shoulder blades and stuff like this. When I'm talking about full mobility as well, you have to remember that armour is always to some degree restrictive. Uh, there's always compromises being made and you don't only gain protection from armour, you obviously gain weight and um, uh, restriction to your movement and extra heat and stuff as well. But you have to accept that you will not have literally the full degree of movement that you have out of armour that you do have in armour. You can't wear gauntlets and have the full range of motion that you would have not wearing gauntlets, certainly with most kinds of gauntlets. And some kinds of gauntlets are very restrictive in what you can do uh, with the wrist in particular. Um, so, uh, so we've dealt with helmets, we've dealt with throats, those interact, then throat and breastplate, those interact. Shoulders, they interact with the breast and backplate, uh, with the cuirass. Um, the cuirass normally includes the culette or fold, uh, the skirt essentially, uh, which goes around the groin. Now, legs are an interesting one. So in some ways, legs can be a little bit more independent, uh, at least in my experience. If you have different experience to this, feel free to chime in. But I think that you could quite comfortably most of the time get your leg armour, your leg harness made by one armourer, and then maybe all of your upper body made by a different armourer. And the two things are not really going to have much problem interacting because the leg harness just attaches to your legs and it doesn't really particularly directly uh, interact with the um, upper body armour or the cuirass or even the fold. One possible exception to that is you have to make sure that the length of the fold, what protects your lower abdomen and groin, is enough to be covering the upper part of the leg defences, which might necessitate the use of a male skirt, usually did, um, or in some cases male hot pants, um, but, but basically male shorts. Um, so you have to make sure that there are no obvious gaps in that region because it's a very vulnerable region and not a, not a part of your body that's very easy to defend when you're wearing a helmet with limited vision either it has to be said. Um, there's also if we come down the body um if we come down to the legs, the way that the greave interacts with the sabaton uh, is also quite important and usually you want to have your sabatons made to fit the um, to fit the greave and the lower legs and it's quite a similar relationship as the bever and the sale in that regard in that one has to basically fit 
up against or inside the other. Um, the other one is arms, of course. Now, um, arms to some extent can be independent. They obviously have to fit with the type of either spaulders or pauldrons that you have on your shoulders, uh, unless you just have a male, um, uh, the projection of the male hauberk or shirt sticking out, which was done sometimes to not so much protection, but you do get more mobility that way um, because you can lift the arm up higher without it conflicting uh, with your helmet or your bever as much as with a pauldron, for example. Um, but arm armour has to obviously interact correctly with the shoulder defences. Also, interestingly, I'll just put the helmet and the bever down for a second. The way that your cuirass is cut around here has to not conflict if you have fully encased upper arms. The fully enclosed upper arms need to be as tight to your body as they can afford to be and still give you full movement and uh, flexation of the muscles and not clash too much with the edges of the breastplate. I have myself experienced a breastplate that was cut a little bit too wide here and arms that were cut a little bit too wide and it massively, massively restricts your movement. So you need those things brought in as tight as they can be to give you the widest range of motion for the arms. And the final one, I guess, that comes to my mind are gauntlets and your van brace. So gauntlets have a cuff on them and the cuff has to be wide enough and angled in the correct way to accommodate whatever style of lower arm cannon uh, the van brace that you have on here. Uh, and you don't want this to be too long because it will interfere with the cuff of the gauntlet. So to cut a long, long story short, um, all of your pieces of armor which interact with each other a bit like a, are a bit like a chain. And each link in the chain has to work with the next link in the chain. Um, but there are parameters for, you know, you can have it working perfectly and you can have it working 90% and it still be fine basically for most use. So you can, to some extent, pick, uh, mix and match pieces of armor and put them together and, expect, and have them work. But you need to be mindful every time you get, if you're getting a new pair of gauntlets, do you think, well, will this have worked with my arm harness? Or if you've got gauntlets first and you're getting arm harness next, do you think, well, is this going to work with my gauntlets? Are the van braces long enough? Is there going to be a gap left here? Are my van braces too short and my cuffs are too short? So it leaves an exposed bit, very vulnerable here. You've got to have the cuff overlapping the lower arms, but equally you don't want it to be so close to the lower arms of the, uh, of the plate here that you've got no wrist mobility whatsoever. Although I have to say, some gauntlets don't really give you much risk mobility, which changes the way you give blows and everything else. That's a topic for another video. Um, so there we go. I hope this has been uh, somewhat thought provoking. This is obviously a video more aimed towards people who either don't have armor at all and are or in some cases never going to have armor, uh, but might be interested in armor as, a, as an idea. You might be doing role playing games or, or writing novels and you might be interested in how armor actually functions and the things you have to think about if you want to make armor work or indeed the restrictions if you get these things wrong. And that can be historical as well. I'm sure there were lots of people going around in armor in the 15th century that didn't work at 100% perfectly and they would just had to live with the, with the consequences. Um, um, or it might be useful for some people who are getting together their harness or have an idea to put together armour and these are some of the things you really want to be mindful of uh, and ask for advice from and always talk to an armourer uh, about you know if you've got existing gear ask them you know I need this to work or say to them I need this to work with what I've got here and give the bits you've got to them if possible because then the armourer can actually check that the two things work together. Hope this has been interesting. See you again uh, for another video on Scholar Gladiatoria channel really soon and take care folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers folks.